So, um, first of all, uh, Valeria uh, saw me or met, I met Valeria at uh, DAC Design Automation Conference in San Francisco. She extended the invitation to me to come here. I visit Detroit. We have a big office here. Uh, we have a lot of automotive customers. So I said, yep, I can do this. So if, if you like this and there's a takeaway from here, please thank her. And if you don't, please see me and I'll try to make up for it for you. <coughs> I also want to provide some context for you. Um, we are primarily a microcontroller company meaning we uh, design and build and manufacture microcontrollers for embedded applications. So um, th the first part of my presentation really talks about the market. And then when I talk about a new platform that we have developed, please put yourself in our shoes, which is a microcontroller company trying to reach out to embedded designers who design and build machines. You know, these machines could be uh, consumer machines, industrial machines. Uh, it could be, um, uh, you know, a, a just about any embedded machine you can think of. Um, and think of them and their challenges and how we're trying to solve their challenges. Because, you know, IoT is a very big name. It's, it, it covers everything and it could easily throw you off. So please keep that in mind. So with that, I'd like to start. And <coughs> IoT... Internet of Things is really um, the promise or the opportunity to connect these embedded machines to the cloud or to the internet, right? So it's Internet of Things. And when you think of the Internet of Things, uh, today it's estimated that there are 5 billion connected devices. And, uh, you know, there are many forecasts out there. Uh, conservatively, it's estimated that in five years, this 5 billion will grow to 25 billion, and there are many out there who are saying 50 billion. So whether it's 25 billion or 50 billion, the growth rate is going to be enormous. And so uh, people or customers or embedded engineers need to find ways to scale their business models very rapidly. The challenge that we all have today our customers have in the embedded world. So whether you know, somebody is building a treadmill or a, a home appliance washer dryer or factory automation, industrial automation, most companies out there follow what's known as a pipeline model, meaning uh, you buy raw material, you make your product, you store it in some warehouse, you move it through the distribution channel and you sell it. And the only way you grow is if on that end, the buyers have increased demand on you. So your ability to scale and grow is limited to the buyers and your customers. Now, <clears throat> platforms, if we look at successful platform models, you see how platforms enable scalability exponentially. There is no direct relationship between you, the seller, and the buyer. And I'll talk about two recent platform examples and then bring you into the IoT world. I think everybody's very familiar with the Wintel platform, the PC platform, but what enabled them to scale was because they allowed software value providers, hardware value providers, and service value providers to play in the ecosystem and add value in the ecosystem. And on the other hand, you had content users. So the more value, the more application softwares that were written, the more accessories that were built, whether it was hard disks, mice, monitors, or uh, network plugging cards, the more of this that was available, the more attractive this platform became to content users. So historically, before the Wintel platform came, most of you, I, I, maybe myself and one or two professors know this, but there was a Tandy computer, an Atari computer, a Commodore, Amiga computer, and these were not platforms. They were vertically uh, assembled uh, machines whereby the hardware and software was provided by one computer. But then Wintel came in, and by virtue of them enabling value, and of course you can see at this far end now, most recently, the iOS and Android platform are doing that. So let's me talk about the second platform. <clears throat> I think everybody's familiar with this platform. Three things that have enabled it to scale. 
it isn't the consumer wanting to buy the smartphone, that direct pipeline relationship. It's the third thing that I'll mention. The first thing is that it has a very powerful processor, adequate memory, and reasonable amount of power to enable it to do what it's doing. The second is that it's connected. It, it is connected to the cloud. But really, what's enabled this platform to scale, different from the Wintel model, is the fact that there are an army of apps developers that have been developing apps and by definition services and products that have enabled this platform to scale exponentially. This is the addition to the Wintel platform. Now, <clears throat> what makes this unique is that many of these apps developers are not technical, but they have a very good business mindset, they have a very good business uh, acumen, and they develop a new business model or they create a new economy by taking advantage of the platform. And I, and I want to stress this point because as I m go later into the embedded world, which we service and many of you might e end up being in, the opportunity exists for embedded machines with IoT to have a similar ability to scale. And I'll talk about that. <clears throat> now, consider why those apps, the successful ones, have been able to create a new economy. This machine, as in the smartphone, collects data. And then later on, when we talk about our embedded machines, whether it's a home appliance, a treadmill, or factory, they also collect data. They transfer this data in the form of information either to the operator or to another machine or to a user to make some decisions. This is where the differences between the smartphone and embedded machine stop. Our embedded machine stop at this level, but these apps now have taken this information to the next layer, which is intelligence. And it is intelligence that you can monetize. <clears throat> it's intelligence that you can sell services. I'll show you two examples. Here is a video-based doorbell. This video-based doorbell uh, collects data, and this data obviously is the video feed, and it transmits it to the end user remotely as information so that you can remotely uh, open a door uh, based on a service person who wants to enter your residence or place of business. So this machine has stopped from the data to the information stage. Now, if we look at another machine, which is Dropcam, many of you might be familiar with this, this machine has taken all three stages. Data is the video feed. It transmits it to the cloud as information or to your smartphone. It uses intelligence in the cloud, <coughs> excuse me, to do analytics. So, if every morning at 8 a.m. you open your refrigerator door, that becomes a known behavior, a good behavior. However, if Monday through Friday that refrigerator door is opened at 10, 15 a.m., that's an irregular behavior. And the analytics, the intelligence, sends you a text and informs you that there was an irregular behavior that occurred at this time. That is intelligence. And so they can sell, they can monetize that. So what they do is, if you want a rolling seven-day storage in the cloud and analytics, they charge you $10 a month. If you want a rolling 30-day intelligence and storage in the cloud, they charge you $30. So you see the difference between the previous model, where all it did is transform data into information. The analytics in the cloud is monetizable. The storage in the cloud is monetizable. So keep this in mind, because in the embedded space, this is the opportunity that exists. And this is an embedded machine. If this machine wanted to do the analytics inside the machine, it would become, the costs would become prohibitive. It would require to have a very strong processor, lots of memory, and so it would no longer be a consumable device. It would be a very expensive device. The reason IoT is promising to change our business models. Remember, IoT is not about connecting to the cloud. It's about 
changing business models is because I can take my information, send it to the cloud, and have access to unlimited processing power, unlimited storage, and perform the type of analytics that would be prohibitively expensive if I wanted to do it in the machine itself. Deep embedded pumps, for example. Pumps cool down factories, they supply water, they supply oil, and in the economy, economics of factories, where a lot of pumps are used, when pumps fail, they have a direct economic impact on the factories shut down, there's a downtime, factory labor productivity. IoT promises that we can predict when a pump is going to fail and we can alert the factory to fix, repair, replace the pump before the factory goes down. So we know under what electrical parameters the pump works. Over time, the pump fails under certain overload conditions. That becomes the information we collect and the intelligence is predicting when it's going to fail. How can we take the previous model and apply it to these embedded machines. You see the difference between the smartphone and embedded machines is that when embedded designers build any of these types of machines, whether it's factory automation, medical, consumer, etc., these designers design with the most efficient approach in mind. A smartphone doesn't think efficiency. It provides a very fast processor, lots of memory, etc. In this scenario, over time, we have learned to pick the most efficient microcontroller, microprocessor, the least amount of memory, because cost is an issue. So as you can see, doing analytics on these machines is not generally possible. So the cloud enables us to take the data that we collect in our machines, pass it to the cloud where we have access to unlimited processing power storage, and do the computation analysis, the analytics there, and then be able to monetize it. The connection, the bridge between embedded machines and the cloud are platforms. If every one of these embedded customers wanted to create their own approach to the cloud, it would be prohibitively expensive. You see, Apple can do that, or Google can do that, or big companies can do that. They can have their own you know, cloud-based analytics, but if every startup company or small company or mid-sized company wanted to create that, build that bridge, it would be prohibitively expensive. So remember, my presentation was about adoption of platforms. And in the embedded space, um, platforms promise to do that. We have developed a platform, and I'll talk about that. I've brought kits. And it's really first in the embedded industry. It's very unique. Nobody has this. Platforms must have a flexible infrastructure. They must accentuate a core competency. So what we've done is we have abstracted designing with microcontrollers to a high level. And we can do this because, not to brag, but we're the number one MCU company in the world. We ship hundreds of millions of microcontrollers. We have done this for three decades. And so accentuating a core competency means there is depth and breadth that we can bring to this platform. And of course, it must be adopted by value added providers. If the smartphone was not adopted by, you know, Blackberry, RIM, as they were going out of business, they pay $10,000 to apps developers, to each app developer to come and write an app for the BlackBerry platform. But they didn't. Hence, that platform couldn't take off. So it's very important that platforms can draw a, an ecosystem because you want a platform to self-sustain. So we introduced the Synergy platform. This next section might sound like advertising. It isn't. Hopefully, it will help you with your designs. And I, I, we've brought kits, and, and uh, it's really not intended to sell you. It's intended to show you a whole new approach to embedded design. What we did, traditionally, embedded designers design with micros writing in C and, and accessing what we call bare metal, you know, accessing the peripherals, accessing, uh, you know, the uh, assets that are on the microcontroller. 
Remember, you want to get connected to the cloud. And I said, don't build this bridge. It's expensive. What you want to do is get on the other side because you want to monetize the analytics that, are, that you can derive from the cloud. What we did is we developed a set of software APIs so embedded designers can now design or program the MCU and, and take advantage of the peripherals that come with the MCU by writing to a, at an API layer. Under the API, under the hood, we have an RTOS, a real-time operating system. I'll talk about that. But more importantly, what we've done is we have added, like the uh, Apple App Store, where developers uh, can write apps, hence increasing the value of the platform. We have also created the opportunity for you, even as students or anybody, to write apps that apply to the embedded world. So, you know, Dolly for lighting, for example, or Econet in the factory. Econet is an Ethernet based connectivity uh, uh, pl protocol. So, various protocols in various industries, various security measures or algorithms, pieces of software that could be viewed as an app but are required in various segments. And so we are enabling that. And of course, we've developed a, a, a new set of microcontrollers and tools to enable this. Let me quickly talk about this. So under the API, we have ExpressLogix ThreadX operating system. We have their um, uh, uh, Xware, so a file system, GUI X for graphics, USB networking. But more importantly, we have, we have developed our a, a organically growing list of application frameworks. If you want to do, let's say, audio, you don't need to waste your time writing the code to generate audio on the MCU. You just invoke at a high level the audio framework and it generates the code for you to do sound. If you want to have a, a, an LCD touch panel, if you want to add graphics, all of these are what we call is, are the bridge. Don't waste your time writing the code, verifying, validating. Use these application frameworks that we stand behind because we're putting, promoting this as a commercial piece of software that we warranty. And it's flexible so that you, know, you can have high level connectivity. So if you want to have a network connectivity, you can be at the high API level. Very flexible platform uh, and the point is as I said in the earlier section, as an embedded company, as an embedded designer, your value and differentiation is no longer in creating a wireless communication or a USB communication or creating a human machine interface. Those days are over. Your value now is in creating a new business model to differentiate your product from other people's products, like the Dropcam one that I showed you. We created a new series of microcontrollers that sit underneath this platform from ultra low power to very high performance. And I want to quickly talk about um, the gallery and then I'll come to the microcontrollers. Like the Apple App Store, we have this thing called the gallery. It's an online store. You can download either an IAR development environment or an Eclipse based development environment. You can as a student, no money is required. Basically, all of what I've showed you, hundreds of thousands of dollars of commercial software you can download simply through a simple license agreement and you can do your design and you're not required to pay anything. In fact, it's a new business model in that even our customers are not required to pay anything. We charge them when they go to production we sell the MCU at a premium. So our business models look, we give you all of this for free. If you're successful, please share your success with us. And if you're not, then you're not required to come up with the upfront costs to license all of this software. And the licensing is very simple. As I mentioned, you go online, you create an account, get a license, choose your development environment, whether you want Eclipse or IAR, and then download all of these softwares and begin your design. The, the reason or how we were able to create this software platform is because we designed this new microcontroller family from scratch 
by making them scalable and compatible. I'll share with you very quickly what this means. Let's say you're building a thermometer. And this is a low-end thermometer. It just has blinking LEDs. The APIs that you use, we use a, let's say we'll use a S1 microcontroller. It's a low power, very small, low cost microcontroller. And you invoke a limited set of APIs that will program the registers required to invoke these LEDs. Now your company sells three sets of thermostats and you can in your mind extrapolate any business, any product that has low end, mid range to high end. Today, excuse me, our customers actually write the software from scratch for the low end, the mid range, the high end, or a lot of it. What, what this model allows is write once, use multiple times. If you have three products in a family, the labor shouldn't be 3x to write the software. It should be 1.2 or 1.3x. Now you go to a slightly bigger thermostat, same company, and, and watch what happens. What we did is as you go to a bigger microcontroller, we kept the power, ground, analog pins, in the same physical vicinity. In fact, as you go from the smallest package to the biggest package, from the low power to high performance, we kept all of the power ground analog pins in the same physical vicinity so that you don't have to re-breadboard. You don't have to develop you know, it from scratch. You can reuse your layout, most of your layout. Then on the registers from the previous one to this one, we retain the old registers. You know, the mid-range uses a segment LCD display. We invoke more APIs by retaining the previous registers. And then you go to the next range, which is graphics-based thermostat, same thing, the previous registers. So we call it orthogonality. The ability to write your software once and use it across product lines. Okay, last topic on our product, and then I'll get back to the IoT side. Safety and security is very critical in these applications. There is a true random number generator within the microcontroller, and I'll sh go through uh, an example with you, and then in your mind you can extrapolate how this could be used. <coughs> Today, <coughs> When customers write their program, they encrypt their program, they give it to a contract manufacturer to program the MCU for them in volume, and they also give the key to decrypt or unlock their program that's going to be um, uh, programmed into the MCU. But, but as you can see, there's a dichotomy there. On the one hand, they program, they, they encrypt the file and give it to a contract manufacturer, and they also give them the key. It's, it doesn't make sense, right? So what we are doing is we're saying this, this true random number generator will generate the keys and when the, um, what we say is you as the customer give your encrypted file to the contract manufacturer but store your key in a secure location. When the contract manufacturer puts the MCU in the programmer, as soon as initialization is hit, that true random number generator generates the keys. The keys are encapsulated in a hardware protection unit and the MCU will create a secure connection to where you have stored your own key. Remember the key that you locked your program with? and it will send a public key to where you have stored your key, extract it, bring it inside, and then what it will do is it will take your encrypted file, put it into RAM, use the key to decrypt it to program its flash. So all of this happens without a human ever touching it. Because remember, cloning, and overproduction is one of uh, the things that hurts manufacturing and of course malicious use of your software. And this is what we do to protect against it. Today, embedded designers start with their hardware design. They write the low level drivers. Remember in our platform, that's not automatic for you. 
They do middleware design. It's a communication stack or some file system integrated with the operating system. What we're saying, none of this differentiates your product. Let the platform do all of this so you can focus on your application code and spend more time differentiating your application code because that's where all the differentiation happens. This is yesterday's embedded design. The world, the embedded design world has fundamentally shifted. This is really the message I'm trying to communicate to you. Now, you want to go into, get into the cloud. You want to get into that intelligence and monetize the intelligence. The fundamentals of cloud packages are basically dashboarding, analytics, storage, reporting, event processing, and some rules engines. Fundamentally, all cloud pack, whether you're using Amazon Web Services or you know, pr proprietary cloud services, this is what you want to have access to. I'm going to show you two unique approaches to how IoT happens. Zebra, maybe you know of them, maybe you don't know of them, but they're the world's biggest manufacturer of barcode scanners and printers, handheld printers. So if you rent a car, the rental car agency, or you know, if you see FedEx, UPS, these guys, they have these small handheld printers. They use a Zebra printer, and the, most of the scanners at the department stores at, uh, use Zebra. So they have this 40-year-old core competency in logistics. What they did is they created a cloud package and sandwiched it with a device API and an application API. The point is this. In the embedded world, in IoT, remember you have heterogeneous devices and heterogeneous applications. A smartphone is a homogeneous machine and it invokes homogeneous applications. In the embedded world, you want to create an environment where you have heterogeneous devices talking to heterogeneous. And what do I mean by that? Let's say you have perishable goods. You are transporting perishable goods. Each one of these boxes has its own unique characteristics. There's a temperature sensor in there, humidity sensor, and its location, it's being communicated through the onboard computer into the cloud. So you're monitoring to make sure that perishable good package, its health is maintained, these are perishable goods, it was delivered on time, and then when it's delivered, ownership changes from the uh, supplier to the store. And you can change the pricing algorithms in the cloud, meaning if I am a um, uh, 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 do we have Safeway out here? You don't have Safeway. Kroger. Kroger's, right? And if I'm a supplier of, a, of milk or a perishable good to Kroger's, I say, look, if you can sell 10 a day, 10 of these boxes a day, or 10 of these pallets a day, you get this pricing. If you can sell 20, you get a different pricing. That pricing algorithm is no longer needed to be controlled or used humanly by a clerk. It all happens in here. This is what I mean by heterogeneous devices using heterogeneous applications. So you have tracked its whereabouts, you have tracked its health, and you are now providing, monetizing this connectivity, this IoT, by saying the more you buy, the more of a price break you get, and it's done in the cloud. And you can do it when it's automated versus maybe it's not possible, humanly possible, when it's not automated. I want to show you another example, and that's Verizon. We know Verizon as a company that provides cellular services. Same thing, they have cloud services. They sell cloud services today. And in the world of IoT, if I am a medical device company and I am building medical appliances that go in an ambulance, for me, if I'm going to monetize my machine, I need to sell quality of service. I need to tell the ambulance or whoever is going to buy my hardware. Remember, I'm helping you transition from the old business model to the new business model. I'm going to say, what's going to differentiate my machine is that I provide you quality of service, meaning as this ambulance is driving, it's going to use a cellular connection to transmit vital signs to the cloud. Because of Verizon, 
I can take over the bandwidth for those cell sites and minimize or not allow cell phones and other users of that, of that bandwidth to interfere with me. Meaning Verizon, when they sell their cloud services to this medical, they provide a service called quality of service. You pay more, but that means you get a guaranteed wide bandwidth of cellular connection. So you with me? That's monetizable. So I'm, what I'm saying is, as embedded designers, as the embedded world, we need to think this way versus the old way. And it's not the connectivity that matters. It's what we do, how we monetize the intelligence that matters. So adoption of platforms is really enabling us to do things we couldn't do before. And it maximizes brand value. Brand means profit. In marketing terms, brand means profit. So I go back as I conclude my presentation. A pipeline model doesn't allow you to scale. Whereas a platform model, by virtue of attracting ecosystem partners, allow you to scale. And so if we look at the problem with this, is you spend a lot of time and money R&Ding. And this is the example I'm going to show you is our skis. R&Ding your skis. You spend a lot of time and money shipping and distributing to wholesalers. And then finally, when, when a customer comes into a retail store, you as the ski manufacturer are lucky if the salesperson is knowledgeable enough to sell your skis to the right consumer. What IoT and adoption of platform promises is maximizing brand value. So today there are tennis rackets, there are golf clubs, there are a lot of sports equipment that come with sensors and these sensors are context aware. They see and they measure, are constantly measuring how your skis are being skied upon, how they're performing. And this information is transmitted into the cloud. And it's a unique use case because, because it knows you, who you are, your personality, it, you know, knows which ski resort you're skiing at, how often, how many hours, are you a downhill skier, mogul skier, cross country skier. So the combination of your unique profile, your unique usage, as well as how these skis are used based on your weight and the uh, interface with, with Earth, you can bypass that pipeline model where there's a lot of waste and efficiency. And so the next time you go to rent a ski or buy a ski, all of that information is known and the rental company can rent you the best possible skis to you, hence eliminating the waste, hence maximizing brand value. And so these are the ways that companies who take advantage of IoT are thinking about monetizing their brand above and beyond a simple connection or data collection. Thank you and I appreciate you listening and I appreciate Valeria's giving me this opportunity. That's the end of my presentation, so if you have any questions. When you have a computer and you have windows on it, we traditionally don't have access, and we currently don't have access to change windows into being whatever we want it to be. With Linux, you have your own open source operating system that you can customize.